time for tomorrow, all educators should be aware of this new world. Um, from David Porter, Chief Executive of BC Campus, who attended uh, most of the meeting, you know, I can feel the buzz in the room that he, you know, let the genie out the pocket. Uh, can't help but wonder if this meeting is similar to a meeting that drafts the constitution of a new country. <laughs> and a comment, of course, from one of our officers a good room. <laughs> Yeah, about the planning meeting, so I mean, there was really a positive sense and a positive energy happening, uh, folk following um, a, a very interesting point raised by Kim Tucker, who is a free and open source software user, who was actually unable to follow the live view stream because of a closed proprietary code, a client that is used to feed the stream. So the point being is when we're thinking about providing access to our learners, we must at least try to make sure that all learners can access whatever we're doing with the technologies of their choice. So it's a point we need to think about and keep in mind. And so, you know, I really love this gym. Um, you know, I wish Bob Jim Tate was on Twitter. I want to be <laughs> with <laughs> That this was going to do your presentation. Rory, they really like <laughs> your notion of let's not get stuck in the um, So this is good. And so, just to get a sense of what was happening out there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Jim, who's going to uh, walk us through a couple of suggestions of how we might structure ourselves for planning the, the smaller steps in realizing our, our bigger vision. Thanks, Wayne. Um, with the overview of proposals for action on the prototype, the single page handout that I passed around at the end of yesterday, um, it's really to try and get people working on things that are of interest to them, where they feel they can make the best contribution. And there are eight sort of subsets of proposals there, and some of them more naturally hang together. Um, we had originally planned that there would be three groups, um, but as the numbers grew, we think we may be able to manage four groups. Um, one other principle before we decide what we're interested in, I mean personal interest and in interest of your institution in terms of contribution is obviously a key principle. But where institutions institution uh, so for example David and I won't be in the same group as we, we know how we think and uh, work together for a while. Um, the other principle that I'd like to suggest is that in, in my experience I've found that the further the institutions are apart, the better the collaboration. <coughs> That's a sort of um, productivity of distance, so that it adds interest and variety of perspective. So I'd like to suggest that we've got a number of institutions from New Zealand. So rather than having a New Zealand group, for example, most of the New Zealand in different groups. I won't apply totally, but there are a couple of principles about um, how we might get the most productive outcomes for the meeting. So, um, what I'd like to get is uh, an indication at this stage of um, who's interested in what, just so we get an idea roughly of what the numbers are like. Obviously, the size of the groups don't have to be equal. Um, so, I'm referring to the prototype proposal for action and the eight subsets. Um, and I'll just work down the numbers, suggesting that. Uh, Point one and two, where we decide on the initial courses to be offered for the prototype. Um, and this idea that we have some peer review in that. So I suggested yesterday that we might have three partners, three or four, working on an issue like that. And as well as helping decide and put a proposal up for the actual initial two or three courses, or however many we decide, uh, would also be prepared to engage in time in a bit of peer review, so that we also look then at, at getting 
the guaranteed cross credit aid amount. So that, that's a chunk is where we decide on the first two or three courses that might be offered. And then we, we look at a process of how they would be, in, a, in inverted commas, guaranteed cross credit or where they could credit into an institutional process using the existing uh, procedures in the institution. So we try and get courses that will have as much cross-credit potential as possible. So that, that's one group. And as I mentioned, I just wonder people in the room who are interested in being involved in that as we break up. Could I just have a show of hands? Um, so we've got one, two, three, four. So that, that five. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Um, so if you don't change your mind, I think five is a good number for that. We've got quite a reasonable distribution of people. Um, no, that's for one and two. Oh, okay. Right. Um, th three is, uh, again, a, a challenge in its own right because we spent not too much time talking about that yesterday. So, Getting the volunteer uh, tutors available, how we recruit them, how we train them, and what logistical guidelines we operate on. There's, you know, there's two or three sub-projects there. Um, and interesting things that we do. I'd just like to mention, not e-moderating, which we're calling this, which is at the core students so they need to be you know have sufficient expertise on a particular course or subject level but the, the University of Sydney now for some time has been running an e-mentoring and I think there will be elements of e-mentoring and e-moderating and helping students get engaged and uh, they run that on a one-to-one -one basis so the alumni I uh, did my master's at Sydney, so I was invited to participate in this. And they just link up uh, any student with a mentor, and they just have this informal support mechanism. It's like the pastoral care support that used to happen on campuses uh, to help first years, you know, get get integrated and so on. So, Jim, yeah, to uh, a question on that. So. <coughs> This group is going to look at the whole notion of academic volunteers, but I assume it's also open to consider alternatives to that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, the, the um, domain name for academic volunteers has been um, sort of managed, we've got that. But the actual model of why I'm introducing mentoring, but the, it's meant to parallel an on campus experience. So you'd have an online tutor supporting a group of students exactly how we do that. It doesn't preclude peer-to-peer -peer or any other format. So this is just a starting point, but it is trying to manage the um, tutorial support that you would typically get on campus in this environment. It's meant to parallel that in some way. At USQ, we've looked at senior students, our own staff and our alumni, as the starting point based on what I was mentioned yesterday was an honor system where we think we haven't got the resources to do a formal recruitment but we trust people in our networks and we can gradually you know, expand our networks in that way. But that's just the starting point. Any of these ideas are open for elaboration or you know, new ideas. So. Having said that, um, could I get an indication from the floor of people who might be interested in contributing to that? Okay. Again, we've got, if you remember who you are, you know, you're just, that's really looking at three and four uh, as a grouping because I think the decisions on how we manage the um, tutorial support <coughs> depends on the pedagogy and the scale of the students. I'm suggesting that when we do the prototype, we might have a hundred students in each of the courses that we offer, maybe two or three. Now, that's not grand scale. It doesn't 
meet the, the Macintosh scale of things, but I think it gets manageable. Um, if, if Wayne wants to run with 10,000 students in his course, that's fine. Uh, so we've got a group there, a group of four. Um, the next uh, issue in terms of open assessment is really the admin interface and so on. Now, a lot of that will be managed in a technical sense and will depend on institutional process. But I think how we manage the assessment um, and what, what cost, how we manage the costing of that as a, a cost recovery service fee and at USQ we thought that we have that for assessment but there will inevitably be some administrative overhead to get this thing organised. So it was a service fee to enable the assessment but not just pay for the assessment. And we have teams of markers in our large courses that we pay an hourly rate uh, to do the marking according to guidelines. So there's, there's money to cover that but then there'll be an administrative interface cost that would be managed you know, by a service fee. Now, getting that off the ground is also you know, quite a challenge. Um, and we need a group to start looking at that. So it's how do we get the assessment? The point I make there is that if we have 100 students who start off, say, only a percentage of those students will put their hand up and say, well, I feel comfortable to pay the fee to be assessed. And we don't know how many that will be. I mean, if we look at typical dropout rates or even, you know, what happens with this non-traditional new student, we'd be uncertain as to what it would be. But the key point is that they only pay money or we give them a scholarship to do that, which was the other suggestion, that with the first trial we might somehow manage to award scholarships for all the initial students, so we had a hundred in each course. So we'd cover the costs of that and then we'd set a fee once we knew what it cost and so on. So again, there's a, an open-ended thing to it. Um, I think I'm kind of missing some of the connecting of the dots here from where we were yesterday and kind of the, the level of detail that we're getting to here. Um, and I don't know if I'm the only one, but um, I assumed that we were talking about the assessment piece being done by the institutions, um, it being conducted in whatever way was deemed to be appropriate by the individual institutions and charged for and the fee set by the institution that was doing the assessment. So and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying in terms of trying to come up with a process and a fee and a structure around that. I think it's uh, to manage that across institutions, you know, that we, we work as a partnership so there will be that individual autonomy at the institutional level and that will be different, but I think when people are looking at the project as a whole, then having some understanding of you know what that level is is important. Just about because I, I mean, I think it's a, a, a very important point, Judith, and, and this is my understanding and reflection on this is for the design of the actual prototypes that we will run. So it's, it's really about these initial, say, two or three courses that we put together as the prototype to operationalize it to inform the model. And yes, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement that the, the way assessment operates at the individual institutions is the institution's prerogative and it's the institution's decision around this. But say for the prototypes, because the thing is we can have the world looking at us with these prototype courses. Do we need to be laying sort of the ground rules for the prototype, not for the, the model? So, so for example, we might decide um, collectively that we want to do scholarships uh, for the prototype, not for the model. What are the rules around, you know, kind of, not the rules, but how will we operate the scholarships in a way that will work within our individual institutions? If that makes sense. Yeah, maybe. No, I guess maybe I'm not understanding the prototype and what you mean by the prototype. I guess my concern, here's my concern. My concern is um, we started out 
talking about being very open and flexibility and access to learners, and we seem to be getting more rigid, defined, structured. Yep. And I know we need some. It can't happen without any of any structure. But my, my own sense around this is that we need to keep the openness because if we lose the openness, we lose the strength of the model. Yeah. But with, within the openness, how, how, how are we going to run the prototype in a way that's going to make sense for design in the future? Because if you, I mean, conceivably, if we have 13 prototypes, we won't, it's going to be hard to scale that in a short time frame. But, but if you, would you not um, assume that depending on how you run the prototype, that is going to set the structure and the process for the future. So yeah. however we're doing this prototype is very important. Absolutely. And, and I think that's why at this point it's very important for us to set the ground rules in terms of how that's going to work, knowing that this can have an impact on the future model. So it's really about collecting on the table and getting a first draft on the table of how we want the prototype to work. And I, I don't see that as moving towards rigidity of structure in any way. It's just um, having a framework for action that accommodates pluralistic alternatives, but yeah. within a, a reasonable way that we understand and benefit from each other's experience. So I see that ultimately there'll be a whole variety of pedagogies and a variety of cost structures and processes and so on. But in the end, we've got to try and get a guideline for action where we can learn from each other's experience and also uh, make it defensible in terms of people looking at a new model. You know, we want it to be scalable, sustainable, and so on. And if we're a partnership, I think we can benefit from working together on that. We can save resources and time you know, if we share our perspectives and get some sort of agreement. But in the end, I think there'll be a, a wide variety of actual experiences for students available. And looking at it from the other way, it's really what are the minimum requirements in terms of this openness in order for it to work for all, for all institutions? Mm -hmm. so, because if we don't talk and get the, the concerns and the issues on the table in, in terms of what will work in my organisation, it's going to be hard to design something that's going to work for all, if you see what I'm saying. If I'm the only one who has a concern, I'm oh, yeah. happy to move on. Yeah. No, but I, 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 I'm very pleased that you, you take them in because this is the real nitty gritty and the important stuff. And we've got to get it right because if we don't get that right, you know, we're not going to succeed. So I'd like an indication from the floor of anybody who would like to sort of reflect on how we get over an assessment uh, moving and the issues you know, related to that debate how we would collect activity-based costs and just get some indicative hint there so that we can move towards uh, the idea of what a cost recovery fee might look like and that will feed into the open business model. I think we each have a costing campaign for each institution as to what cost to uh, attribute. Yeah, and I don't think it's putting the numbers to the, the actual number to the cost, but in the hub, what principles will we use mm. to inform our institutions on how to cost this as recommendations that institutions can consider? Mm. But institutions have total autonomy in terms of the actual pricing structures they would want to use because our costing structures are all different. But what principles would we use to help inform the partnership? The, the other thing there is also the style of assessment that you do and how you're going to do it. You know, whether it's project based, whether you have online examinations or whether you have portfolio assessment, all of that will inform you know, this space in terms of what's feasible to move forward. And potentially I, I, could, I would imagine as with pedagogies one could have a number of options that different institutions could apply within the assessment model. But we need to think about what those options are. So how, how we stand? Just, um, is it in this section that we would look at where enrolments happen and, and how and what time? Uh, for example, if students are just uh, in the course but not doing the assessment, they would still need to be enrolled in some capacity sometimes to be able to get into an LMS or whatever, you know, how the course is running. Is that enrollment happening where the 
course it's happening in the institution, or is there some way that you want to also monitor, collect enrollments at an OER uni level? Uh, it's it's a very good that question, that uh, that and that let that me respond that. in terms of how I think it might work. And again, this is all open for discussion and refinement by all our anchor partners. A way I envisage this working is uh, student X engages with some of our OER learning courses, right? At that point, there is no direct relationship with the conferring institution, the anchor part. So if you, I imagine there's, there's independent study, there, there's e-tivities, there, this is peer-to-peer -peer support that's happening, but there's no direct institutional engagement other than whatever we design for Academic Volunteers International. <coughs> okay. We don't know what that is yet. But at some, some point in the future, that learner decides, I actually want to formalize my assessment and my credential, and then they put their hand up. And at that point, that, in, that individual then decides which one of the partners do I want to acquire my assessment and or credentialing services from. And at that point, then there's a legal relationship between the student and the institution. The OER University Network has nothing to do with that contractual relationship in a, in a very you know, sort of hard traditional sense. But what you can facilitate as a network uh, is through open source technologies, some enrollment data uh, that is beneficial to your system so that we can pass on that data to you at the point you need it. For example, and it's just to give an illustration of how a system like that might work. Where some learner, I mean, it's this old distance education problem, you know, in terms of reporting uh, what your completions are. I mean, because the British Open University used to have, I don't know if they still have the model, but you, you, it's open registration, you register. But now, if that student flunks out within the first, you know, two weeks, or, you know, do you count that as an enrollment? Is that attrition? And so the British Open University developed these systems in a way that, you know, after the trial period, so to speak, that they then became sort of kind of legitimate enrolled students, if you, if you will, from a statistics point of view. So kind of what we're doing is for the OER learning that's happening out there, any, anybody, anywhere, anytime, um, they are not legally students of the institution. But what we've done is we, we, we've put the programs out there in a structured way using OER to the point that, uh, and design the system in a way that the learners are pre-preparing themselves for a potential assessment model that we design. Uh, just make a brief comment about that. Um, again, I think the students aren't part of our um, sort of statistical count. Uh, in a traditional sense for government funding because we're a government funded institution. The relationship starts when they become assessed. When they say I'd like to be assessed, then they'll have to be somehow integrated into our system. Um, we run a what we call a single unit for credit for continuing professional education where people can actually do a course and gain credit for it uh, without being in a programme. So that, that would be a model that we could use where people, say, do one of our courses in the system and they would be recorded as having a, a single credit without being enrolled in the program. Well, if they gathered enough credits from the system, a few from Wollongong, a few from Thompson Rivers, whatever, that's when they would be able to put it on the table or go to Alpha Basket, for example, and say, we've got this and we'd like an award. So all of that flexibility will have to emerge from this. Uh, but the way that it was originally conceived was to not complicate it by having to do uh, meet government reporting guidelines for this. It's more in the continuing education space, as we call it. So it's in this section that you want to discuss those things? Yeah, and that's an, an issue in relation, just coming back to that, that we've got you know, the styles of assessment, how we manage it, how we manage the credit transfer, the credit management, the administration, leading into what is the cost to do all of that. So there's a lot of questions to be answered there. 
is anyone game to take that on as a, an issue? Yeah, we've got one person from the client state. Anyone would like to work? Another brave person. Yeah. Well, we might I uh, just put that on hold, but I think it, it, it is not as urgent in some respects, except how we might manage the assessment is urgent. How we manage the administration, I think we've got time to reflect on it. Um, the last group, the fourth group, um, might get an indication of how many people haven't committed to a group yet. Um, quite a few. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll have time to balance it out. Thank you. Um, on, on this assessment, uh, I don't see any uh, that this is a commonality of the assessment. Are we going that way? It's not I mean, I see that we do the assessment hourly. Okay. Um, but I'm not opposed to it. I think that there might be uh, possibilities for for funding if we can get some standard assessment for OER courses. I think there's a real possibility. So I'm not opposed to it, but as I see it now, I mean, we're going to do our assessment our way, and everyone's going to do their assessment their way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think we should also consider um, an, a, a unified approach to it, that if we can get somebody to help fund some really strong, robust, uh, automated testing systems. And just a quick response, Roy, and I, I agree entirely, because I mean, the strength of the model and how, how we're going to operationalize this is institutions have to use the existing policy enablers that exist within the institution. But different institutions have different policy enablers. So, for example, I mean, Athabasca University has both the PLA and the uh, Challenge for Credit Policies. But other institutions may not have those, those, those enablers in, in, in that structure. But what we've got to consider when we're putting the OER in courses is how do we prepare the, if you will, the asynchronous assessment preparations that may be necessary for the model. So I don't think it's so much uh, a unified approach, but if different institutions are going to use maybe a portfolio to assess that, then we've got to include it in the, the upfront design of the program. So this stage is really just that first take to get those issues on the table. Because we have a, we have tacit knowledge in, in, in this room. Because we've all got tacit knowledge of what is likely to work within our own institution. So let's not design something that's not going to work in our own institution with sufficient flexibility in the model. So that's, I think that's what it's about here. Yeah. But I, I do take the point, I mean, if we could design some unified system that might work in some cases and it's funded, that's a benefit to the network as well. Yeah. Uh, I personally don't like this term unified in the sense that it implies that we've got one system. Um, I still like the idea, as Rory mentioned, we're going to do it our way, but we can benefit from other people's experience. For example, yesterday the model I put up of the portfolio within Moodle as part of our assessment process. There's no need to reinvent that wheel because it's based on a database module which we're happy to share if you're interested in using that. So it's looking at that. We haven't got challenge policies. We don't do a lot of PLAR, um, but I'm happy to put that on the table in our institution if I've got a good model to follow and some experience. So it's, if I look at it from the student's point of view who may be saying, studying with a range of institutions and getting that experience. It would be, I think, useful for the student to have some experience of you know, what the different interfaces are and how we manage that. Because we lose students if the difference is... Uh, I see that balance again, but not unification, not in the sense of a common, single approach. But mm -hmm. did you want... Okay. Um, no, I was just sort of reflecting on yesterday when, when the conversation around the courses and each institution contributing courses, I sort of queried that as to whether X institution contributing a course is it the whole package and, and I think there wasn't a, a full clarity on that around, yeah. you know, the course goes up, so I'm interested in that specific course which means I kind of have to do it with this institution and then this becomes just a consortium recognizing each other's credits as opposed to I think what I'm hearing Wayne say this morning which I agree with 
which is the common materials that we're sharing that come from multiple sources and then if not standardized then at least the opportunity maybe to to you know display your excellence at, at numerous institutions depending on what they're asking you to contribute so it may not be that we all accept the portfolios but you know if someone's preparing that and then says you know what ideal world i really like x college to look at it or y college they would have that flexibility other than as soon as i decide the course i'm locked in and it just becomes an articulation agreement which i think is not as strong I have a different view. I mean, I think the articulation agreement is the strength of the model. I think yeah. having it, I think absolutely having it as part of the model, but if it's the only it um, element, then it really is just a consortium yeah. of, of like-minded schools that aren't really collaborating around other things like assessment. And, and the other side, I'm just putting on my counting hat for a moment, um, by collaborating on this upfront piece, <coughs> that's where we're going to save cost. Yeah. The moment we try and do this as a single institution, there's no benefit in the network. Yeah. Because it's, it's simple math. It's, it's about how many institutions, can we get 10 institutions together to actually agree and collaborate on A, B, C to save cost? Because this must save cost. Because if we don't save cost, there's no point. There's kind of no point in doing it. But in a way that will fit within the existing system. And I think that, that's the advantage. And it's really about finding out what is the area of overlap between institution based policy and what we can do within our institutions and this collaboration. Where, where, what is the biggest overlap we can achieve? Because that's where we generate the biggest savings. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think we have to remember that um, when it comes to the peace on assessment, um, we, as institutions, are assessing the learning to give our credit. You have to. And it has to meet our expectations and our standards to get our credit. So however that happens, it's our institutional credit that would be given. And, and that? And that, everyone may and that have is a different approach. Everyone may have a different approach, and everyone may have a different way of looking at that. But if it's our credit, then it has to meet our standards validated by us. And that's not the I absolutely agree with that. I think it's more likely that if your institution is offering the course, that nicely ties it together, meets expectations, the pedagogy, the approach, the style of assessment fits in. I find it difficult to think, and maybe it's because we don't have a plan that we assess somebody else's process in some way. I'm more comfortable, and USQ would be more comfortable if we open up with our courses and we assess in our own way, but we can, say, use that credit to get a degree from Athabasca or Thompson Rivers or whatever. So the student experiences a number of institutional processes and qualities, and the cross credit is the accreditation, is the articulation agreement. That's the glue that holds the thing together. It's the way that I think would work logistically and be the quickest way that we could move. But I think some of these issues will come out in the mix of the discussion. So having got a little bit of clarification, there's time for more. The last um, grouping for the morning that I was suggesting was to look at actually devising a project plan for the prototype in terms of timing. But I think to do that effectively, we need the evaluation work. We started on the context of evaluation. We need the input evaluation if you're happy to work with the SID model, which is a framework which I think will work for this. So I'm suggesting that the, the evaluation of the context and input evaluations would feed the prototype uh, plan and timing. So I'm suggesting in a way that six, seven and eight sort of flow into another grouping. Um, it's really getting a more systematic collection of information about the context and the issues, the processes and the assets that we have and how we operate and putting that in, into a plan. So that, that to me is going to be an ultimately critical part 
but we need the feeding from all of the other groups. Um, so I'd like an indication of anybody's interested in the sort of project planning evaluation as a, a package. Okay, I'm, I'm interested in that. So we've got three, um, four, five, six. Okay, um, what I suggest that we do is just reflect that we have four groups unless there's a proposal to have another group. Except the assessment group with any We probably have one. And that's not to say that it's not important. I mean, we need to plan this and we need to get it sorted. I'm a little confused about the assessment question too, because in number one, it's talking about that sort of guaranteeing cross credit, which seems to me one of the subsets of the assessment question. So I wonder, I, I don't know whether the five plus Alan could split into sort of two groups of three and discuss one, two, you know, maybe that's, that's actually a good suggestion. No, that is a good suggestion. So we go back to three groups and Alan can join the, the first group. And it is part of an issue then. And I think some of these things we've got more time to sort out. So just reviewing that, the, the first group will look at point one and two and the assessment. So can we just have hands up for the first group? So we've got quite a large group there. So where would they meet? I think the Rome. largest group should meet here. Yeah. Okay. So this group meets there, and um, what we would let you sort out, you facilitate a report of themselves. Um, the second grouping is around the tutorial online student open support, academic volunteers, and the like. Um, so how many people are, have committed to that? So we've got a smaller group that's one, two, three, four. So Robin's office? Yep. Okay, we just, yep. the, this is the volunteers. Oh, okay, so I'm going to take the Okay, so that's, that's in Robin's office. And then the last group is really looking at, you know, the context and input evaluations feeding into a, a project plan, which will ultimately take inputs from everywhere. So just get an indication of numbers in that group again. So that's yeah, what's the, plan group, yeah. the last group, one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, where do we this should be? Uh, probably Phil's office on this chair. Oh, yes, thanks, Robert. Okay, just a brief word about the process. I think it takes time for us to get onto the same wavelength. Um, but I'm optimistic that if we have an open mind about this, we'll get something that we feel comfortable with, which is my model of whether it's going to succeed or not. You know, if we've got tensions and concerns, we need to get those out on the table and reach a point that the, the consensus in inverted commas is in a comfort zone because we, we won't move our institutions into a common model. And what we really have got to do is say, will these principles work in our institutions? So that's as close as we get. I don't expect a total lack of cognitive dissonance, but just that we think we can make this work yeah. uh, in a practical sense in our context. And also, you know, from our perspective, we here, this is kind of a first take at, the, at a draft plan. We're not going to be able to address everything and we're not going to get it all right. Um, and, and to be honest, this, this is the creative part of the process, which is in fact the hardest part of what we're trying to do. It's not, it's not easy. But the thing is, let's bring our tacit knowledge together and get a first draft of something which may work for the future that can use as the basis for refinement as we move forward when we're working you know, in a distributed fashion. So that's kind of the thinking behind this. Um, what I also just want to add, what we set up in the agenda, and again, to get to the agenda, you go to the Wiki Educator homepage. At the, at the top, there's a link uh, for the agenda, and you'll get to the agenda page. I've made a slight adaptation in the technology we're going to use for keeping track of what our thinking is. Um, and you just scroll down to the agenda, and the different groups will be here. So, so group one, 
there will be an Etherpad document for you, and you'll have access to this. There was a bit of an issue around access to these documents yesterday. I've got issues and access to them, Fred, and I didn't have them yesterday. <laughs> oh, but I'm using two uh, Etherpad. Are you? Are you oh, that's all right. But just keep going now. Oh, we'll, yeah, okay, we'll figure it out. Because <laughs> yeah. this, this shouldn't be an access to you. I'll try to figure it out. Um, but basically the idea is with, within any of these groupings there might be a number of actions, this is logic model speed, a number of actions that we need to exercise or plan for within that model. And so what you would do is, you know, what are the aims of that activity to achieve one of the objectives of that group? What are the short-term objectives? You know, just a little bit of structure. What kind of inputs would be needed in order to achieve that, right? And if the group has any draft, this is first draft, decision proposals that the bigger group needs to think about over a period of time. And of course, there could be more than one action for the particular work. And so you can make as many of these things as, as you would like. Makes sense. And of course, this is entirely open. You're free to adapt, modify, improve it, and sell it if you like. <laughs> so, in terms of the guideline, we're having a break at what time? Um, so, we're having a tea break, and then after tea break, we still continue in the groups. We come back to the report session. Mm -hmm. so the what time is that, Rob? For the tea break. Yeah. And then we have a session before yeah. lunch. At 12, yeah. yeah. Fine. So we've got the rest of the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got essentially the morning to start you know, mm. flushing the same. Did you check on Phil's room? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the big group were in here. The second group were in Robin's office. So the back and tail's office is ready for later.